Father, we just ask now, Lord God, that you come and breathe on us, that our time not be spent in vain, Lord God. Grant us understanding according to your word. Let us get the big ideas. Let them be deeply embedded in our hearts. Lord, let our faith be supported and also informed and directed. And Lord, give us great clarity, Lord, as we grow closer to you day by day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, be close to us this morning. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're finishing this chapter today. And we've been in this passage for a little bit of time. I just got kind of bogged down in it um, in a good way uh, because it's discussing what is the new covenant? What goes into our salvation? And the word covenant in the Greek is diatheke. Dia means thorough, means all bases are covered in this covenant that need to be covered. Dia and then theke is from tithemi to set something down, to set it down. So thoroughly setting something down, like you would set down a lease agreement for a house or a car. Everything needs to be in that lease agreement. And in the old ancient times, they would put covenants between men together for the purchase of property, different things. One party would write out everything that has to do with that, and the other party would agree to it. And then usually they would cut covenant by uh, the sacrifice of an animal to show the cost that went into that covenant. And we don't have the sacrifice of an animal, but the sacrifice of our Lord for the covenant that we have with Him. I'm going to be thankful He brought the sacrifice to the table and He paid it all. And in this vein, we are studying the new covenant. And we have for some times and how it is differentiated from the old covenant. The covenant that Moses gave when He brought down the Ten Commandments and how important it is that He did and that we learn not to lie, not to defraud our brother and all those good things. The problem with the old covenant that Paul is going to address is that not that it's not good, but that we're not good and we need a savior. And without Christ, it's all in vain. So we're going to study the differences between those covenants this morning as we read, and then we will finish this chapter. But let's read now 2 Corinthians 3 verses 6 through 18. God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church that he planted. And when he left, men came from Jerusalem with letters of recommendation that they were legitimate and they had come from Jerusalem and that Paul had missed, missed it a little bit with Jesus. 
And they were saying things like, you've got to keep the whole law of Moses in order for the forgiveness of Jesus to work. You've got to keep all of the rules that Moses gave, and Jesus is kind of the add-on. Jesus is kind of the complement, but the meat really comes with Moses. Paul's going to say no. Moses said everything he said to identify in us that we're never going to be good enough by rule keeping to please God. And Moses, the end of the law is to direct us to our need for a Savior in Jesus Christ. The Judaizers said, yes, we accept Jesus. He lived and died and rose again. And he's one of the guys. Paul said, no, he's not one of the guys. The whole thing uh, rises and falls on who Jesus is, has no meaning apart from Jesus, points to Jesus. And this is more than a religious exercise. This is to bring us to the place where we have a personal relationship with him as our personal savior from our own sin. And Paul, and the Bible's very good about this. It always tells you what something is by making a distinction with what it's not. And Paul's going to do this again. He's going to say, this is what the old covenant brings. This is what the new covenant brings. The old covenant being the covenant that Moses gave from Mount Sinai. The new covenant, which was established by Christ in the upper room. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, which was shed for you. And he started over. And let me, let me just read something to you this morning as well. Over in Hebrews chapter 8, Paul really, and I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, but anyway. The writer really elaborates on the new covenant versus the old. And let's look at it for a moment. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 and following says, For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them... He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. And write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. And none of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all, everybody say all. All, all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins, and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So here the writer of Hebrews says that the old covenant was good. Paul's going to say that the old covenant, the law is spiritual over in Romans chapter 7. The problem isn't with the law. The problem is with people. And they could not keep His covenant, neither did they continue in His covenant, and therefore He disregarded them. But He didn't stop there. He says, I'll make a new covenant. I'm going to be glad that He didn't stop there. He says, I'll make a new covenant. And my new covenant is that I will write my law, not on tablets of stone, but on their hearts. I'll write it on their hearts. How many of you know that's good? And in their minds, they'll know in their mind and in their heart. And nobody's going to have to tell them to know God because from the least to the greatest, wherever they are in their Christian walk, wherever they are in society or wherever they came from, from the least to the greatest, all will know me. Because I will be their teacher by my spirit. And then he says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. How many of you like that? How many of you have done knucklehead things and you just need Jesus to be merciful to your unrighteousness? Isn't that nice? 
This is part of the new covenant. This is part of the diatheke. Writing it out. This is what is written out and agreed to. I will, be un, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. How many of you like that part of the lease agreement? How many of you like that part of the purchase price agreement? Isn't that nice? You guys wake up a little bit and just say amen even if you don't know what I'm talking about. Amen. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. This is the new covenant that the writer of Hebrews, he appeals to Jeremiah 31. That's where it was written. And he says, this applies to today. Amen. In Paul's understanding, there are two ways to heaven. Or basically, there are two religions to heaven. And you can go either way. One way is... By keeping all the law and by being good enough and by works righteousness. You can get to heaven if you're good enough. The problem is the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And people that are in a performance-based religion, meaning it's up to them to be good enough to get to heaven, People that are in that kind of system, they have an agenda. And the agenda is to be good enough. And because they cannot compare themselves to God for that good enoughness, because they will fall short, they begin to compare themselves to one another. And you have to hate on somebody in order to be good enough. You got to focus on who you're better than. And or you got to go, well, I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not like old Joe. At least I'm not like this person. It creates an us and them kind of deal where you just love to hate on certain people because you're at least better than they are. Well, I would never. Oh, okay. Well, the Lord has kept you from that. But there are some people, they're very religious and they're in this, man, I'm just trying to be a good person and do good and be good and everybody can know that I'm good. And the problem is, you can't keep up with God. The chief attribute that describes God is the word holy. It's not love, it's not any of the, All those things flow through the word holy. Man, the angels can't even see Him. They have wings in Isaiah 6 covering their eyes. As they cry day and night, holy, holy, holy. They never stop. Is the Lord God Almighty and even God's biggest, bestest prophet, Isaiah says, I'm undone for I've seen the Lord. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among people of unclean lips. I'm no match for this guy. I'm not his contemporary. There's no way I belong here. And the angel came and took a coal off the altar and put it to his mouth and purged him of his sins. And says, now you're going to be my mouthpiece. It's a work of God that makes you better and not something that you bring to the table and muster up for God to like you more. But it is amazing to me how much performance-based religion gets into the church even to today. Measured by how many times you go to church, measured by all these different things. And I think accountability is important, don't get me wrong, but it needs to be in its place. It does not define your value. God does through Jesus Christ. See, performance-based religion says your value is based upon how well you're doing. Do you understand? How much good you've done versus not done. How much you're useful versus not useful. And that's not Christianity. That is not the new covenant. When you come into covenant with God, did I say the second way? It's through Jesus Christ, the only man who went through the first way. He's the only one that did it right. He's the only one who hit the mark, according to the Bible. He's the only one who's legit and credible to save. Amen. Praise Christ, our Savior. Amen. And in the new covenant, the covenant that God makes with us, not based upon our works. You know, all kinds of religions have Jesus in it. 
Islam, this and that, where he's one of the guys. But biblical Christianity says this guy is not one of the guys. This is the Lord. This is our Savior. He is the only one that is legitimate to save. And that he lived and he died on a cross for our sins. And he's raised from the dead to demonstrate his lordship. What is it? Romans chapter... I'm all over the place today, but you'll enjoy it today and get what you need. Romans chapter 14, verse 9 says, He both lived and died that He might be Lord. And He rose again that He might be Lord, it says. Lived, died, rose again that He might be Lord. To say, look, I'm legit. Witnessed by apostles. Prophesied all throughout the Old Testament about His coming. And He is legit. He is qualified to save some people think, oh, Christianity just beats people down, makes them feel bad about themselves, make them feel like they're no good, and gets them in such a place that they can get brainwashed. But what, it, but what the end goal of Christianity is, is not to make you feel bad, but to get you to a place where you begin to give God the glory instead of yourself for any progress you make in this life. How many of you understand Christianity teaches that you are not God? Now the world thinks there are a bunch of rule makers out there and they're the standard for everything and they're self-righteous doing it because they come down from the big old mountain of self. With their Ten Commandments of whatever they are. The problem is you are not qualified to be God. You are an actor at best. Yes, you're able to hang out in society because you're able to lie and cover up. But Jesus said to all the religious people that are trying to uh, be religious, all they were doing was trying to be seen by men. And he said, you're a bunch of whitewashed uh, whitewashed tombs. You're good on the outside, but I know what you're doing when nobody's watching. And the Bible says the secrets of men will be exposed on the day of judgment by Jesus Christ. Yeah. And brothers, I want to tell you, all we were before we got saved were good actors. Yeah. Who looked down our nose on people that we thought were less than us. And that is religion, and it is, has an agenda, and it has a narrative, and it ends in death. And a bunch of mean people. Right. That are proud and arrogant instead of grateful and humble. Y'all with me today, all right? Everybody happy? Amen. So God is looking for people that are, yes, broken, yes, beat down, yes, disqualified, so that He can do a work in them. At the end of the day, people praise the Lord because they know where you came from and what you were and what you are because of His Spirit in you. And they give glory to God. So the end result of Christianity is not to beat you down. The end result is for you to give God the credit for taking stupid and turning it into smart. It's not to beat you down where you say, well, I'm just awful. I'm just going to go to church and try to be really. No, it's to get you to the place where you say, I need a savior in my life. I'm a train wreck apart from being connected to God. And religion will do this. It'll... uh, It'll separate you from God ultimately. We're going to read about that a little bit here. There's a veil representing our separation through the old covenant with God because it's all about our works and it ultimately separates us from God if it's up to us and our works. Some people see this as a cop-out. They say, oh, where does human responsibility come in? Brothers and sisters, human responsibility is great, but you were broken. And God had to take you and make you somebody that could be responsible. Amen. He healed your mind. He healed your heart. He healed you so that you could walk when you were totally lame. So we went through some of these this week, and I, or the, the last couple of weeks, and I want to hit on the last part of this passage today. Very quickly, Paul says that the new covenant gives life where the old covenant ends in death. separates you. It isolates you. You become a very isolated person 
and a lonely person when you're religious and better than. Either by shame or you don't want to be found out. And some people come to church just in time for them to be found out and then they leave. But how many of you know when you're in church, stuff comes to the top. And if it's all about how you look to everybody else, you won't probably stay very long. But the old covenant, it puts a barrier between you ultimately and God because it's all up to you and you're not good enough to keep up with Him. Secondly, not only the Spirit of God give us life through the new covenant, but through the, what Jesus did and offers in salvation, it's Spirit-empowered, not empowered by the flesh. He says it is a work of the Spirit and not of the letter. And the Holy Spirit is the one that drives the new covenant. He is the one that puts the law of God in our heart. It puts a compass in us so that we live godly lives. Our circumcision isn't made with hands, but by the Spirit of God. And then we also read here that it's not only a ministry of the Spirit and of life, the new covenant, but it's also a ministry of righteousness versus the old covenant that ultimately condemns. I may be thankful today that you were declared not guilty because of Jesus Christ. That He died and you were justified by faith in Him. Now listen, there are some people that don't believe you're justified until the end of your life and you go to heaven. That is not Bible. Good Protestant theology says that when you believed, you were justified. Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And that the faith of Abraham belongs to us. You're not justified 10 years into good church attendance. Jesus sent Paul, Acts, Acts chapter 22. He says, I'm sending you to people to open their eyes and to turn them from the power of darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Yes, he said, and they will be justified or sanctified by faith in me. That it is faith in Christ. Man, people that believed in Jesus and were healed, they were healed by because of their faith. And it was notable. Didn't come in the mail. Some people, they just say, well, I did believe, but boy, oh boy, my justification is really in my endurance and really keeping up with the Joneses and blah, blah, blah. No. Those he justified, Romans 8, them he also glorified. Aorist tense, one time in the past, Boom. Why? Because it highlights what he did on that cross over what you're doing in good work keeping. Do you understand? It doesn't make what he did on the cross one of the guys. It says that's the end all be all of the whole matter. I am justified by faith in Christ and in his shed blood for my sins. I have signed up for the new covenant and everything it says Amen. by faith. I'm going to sign up for the, I don't remember your sins anymore, guy. And I'm going to be merciful when you're a knucklehead. How many of you ever have problems? And I'm going to write my law in your heart, not on the Bible, and all of you will know me from the least to the greatest. That's the new covenant. Some people, man, they get saved and they know just a little bit about this new covenant. That's why I'm spelling it out for you because there's some people they. I think salvation's a little bit like made a promise not to look at porn so much or made a promise to get over cigarettes or be a better person and they feel like God forgave them after they really hardcore repented. But this is going to say those who turn from the law to the Lord are those that are saved. And that is the turning point from rule keeping religion to the Lord. And it doesn't say those who make him Lord. It says those who Shift their focus from, i got to do all this stuff and maybe put a little Jesus on it, to Christ alone is the one who saves. People wearing their what would Jesus do bracelets, that's great. But you better touch the first base, what did Jesus do? Before you get all into what would he do? And yes, cigarettes damage your lungs. And yes, other stuff is damaging, but it's not primary. This is weightier, folks. Listen to me. This is weightier than rule keeping. And there's a morality code in the Bible, and I agree with it. But in this chapter, uh, the book of Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are early writings of Paul. 
most of the New Testament wasn't written yet fully. And the only Bible that these people had was the Old Testament. And Paul is saying what Jesus did, listen now, please understand. What Jesus did on the cross is greater than the entire Bible that you have. It's weightier, it's more important, it outshines every one of the commands of the Old Testament. Literally, throw your Bible out if you think that that's what's going to save you keeping those rules. It's what Christ did on the cross. First and foremost, the foundation of our life put us in a different category where God treats us as sons and daughters through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Our justification is there. God is for us, not against us. We're His children and no longer slaves to sin. Do you understand? Is this making sense? Do you all understand? So what, what makes the new covenant better? It ends in life and not death. It is spirit run, not good luck with that run. It justifies instead of condemns. Fourthly, it's going to say in this passage that the old is passing away. It says it three times, seven, some of the verses. Three times. The old covenant is passing away. But the new covenant remains. He did not say the new kingdom remains. He didn't say cool stuff that Jesus did remain. No, the covenant remains. The old covenant always falls short because it's relying on faulty people. But the new covenant doesn't end in your death. It begins in His death and is ratified by His death. And it's permanent. Everybody say permanent. It abides. He says the new, what Christ did remains. What Moses does is like it's a little uh, glow on your face and then it fades away after a while. Moses went up the mountain on Exodus 34. His face glued, glowed, glued. His face glued. When he came down, that's King James, right? It glued. <laughs> Verily. As he came down, his face glued like, and then... And he, put a, and he put a veil over it because he's freaking people out and they were at a distance, scared to come, against, come to the mountain. God was at a distance. And then it would fade and he'd take his veil off and he'd go back up and he'd glue, glued some more. But Paul's making, a, Paul's making a distinction between going into church, being dazzled by monster trucks and uh, 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 lasers and, and all the dazzlement of churchianity and all the buildings that it's built, and all the stuff that goes into religious pomp. Maybe a, a pastor is mightily somebody and has a throne that he sits on, and all this stuff that goes with being religious, you know. But all that stuff is just to dazzle you, but enlightenment doesn't come through that. It comes through Jesus Christ. He is the one who turns the light on, and it does not fade it doesn't fade on Monday. It doesn't fade on Tuesday. You go to church for your little glow and it starts fading. No. What Christ puts in you is Himself the light of the world. He's going to say it in the next chapter. It is God who caused the light to shine in the darkness, who, sh who shone in our hearts. It's not like the old stuff that's up to you. God bless you and hope you make it. And throw some Jesus sprinkling in there. Oh, I'm messing with people today. Glory to God, here I come. Those are the three things that we find of the new covenant. It's life, giving spirit and power, justifying and permanent. Now, what does it affect in us? Fifthly, it gives us hope. It gives us hope. He says here in this passage, he says, Therefore, verse 12, since we have such hope, we have great boldness of speech. And how many of you know that hope purifies a person? How many of you thankful for the hope you have because of what Christ has done for you and that He's in covenant with you? How many of you have more hope than if it was all in rule keeping? How many of you would have quit a long time ago on yourself and probably did when you thought it was all up to you? Come on, you guys. When Jesus was just one of the guys and He wasn't the Savior. But we have hope. 
It's not something that we're mustering. It's something we have. And we use great boldness because we have hope. And it's the anchor of our souls. The new covenant gives us something that rule keeping doesn't. And that's hope. Hope based in Christ, not in how well you've done. Unlike Moses who put a veil over his face, the idea here is we have an unveiled face and we are open and bold and our boldness comes through knowing that Christ has forgiven us. He loves us. He's for us. And he's written his law in our hearts. We have hope and boldness. How many of you are thankful for the boldness he's given you? Knowing where you came from, how many of you still have boldness today because your confidence is in the Lord because you've seen what he's done with you? Amen? That doesn't come through veiled face Moses' law keeping. And I would even go as far as this, and this isn't anything I've read. So this is a freebie that probably needs some speculation. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks about only women wearing a veil. And here he's almost saying, if you're a, uh, a law-keeping Pharisee, it'll, it'll, it'll keep you from being bold. You'd be kind of effeminate, veil-wearing. Um, instead of open face, bold like a lion, strong. Remember, he's talking to the Corinthians here. So that's just a freebie. Glory to God. All right. It says their minds were blinded here. They couldn't look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Verse 13, the end telos in the Greek, meaning they only could see a little bit with Moses where they couldn't see the end of what he was doing. He was pointing to Christ. He was pointing, look, this is the law, it diagnoses, but Christ is the medicine. He's the one that heals and delivers. It points to Christ. But they couldn't see it. And also the word end and telos means toll or tax. They could not see through being religion the toll it was going to take on them. The tax that they were going to have to pay through being in performance-based religion. They could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Their minds were blinded because of that separation from God. Based upon their works, their minds were blinded. And that same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. When it says their minds were blinded, the word blinded is porao in the Greek. It literally means their minds were calcified. Y'all have any cal calluses on your hands, some of you? How many of you have little calluses? A callus is unfeeling. It's something that has been rubbed so rough that you can't feel, you're not sensitive. And the idea here is that they have been so removed from the presence of God because of the veil of their own works that they've become calloused to anything that is spiritual. That callousness comes from their own sins and the sins of others living in a world that's fallen. How many of you know it's very easy to get callous these days? But their minds are, very, their minds are literally, uh, the word is to be petrified or to be as dull as a rock. And so it's used as blindness here. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody that was so blind they had calluses all over their eyes. But that's what the world is without Christ. Calloused in vision. They don't have vision. And it says it's on their minds in verse 14. In verse 15, it's on their heart. The veil lies on their heart. So it's not just their heart that is insensitive, but their very mind is dull and blunt, and they're not able to see the end of a thing. So God comes through the new covenant to give us hope, and then He also comes to give us the sixth thing that I have here is He comes to give us vision where we've been blind. Because when you live in a world where you are very temporal. How many of you, I tell you what, give me five more minutes, really and truly. I'm serious. Can y'all wake up enough for that? Because I see this right now. Start talking about their eyes and somebody's like, yes, Lord. Dullness, come unto me. Yes. But as a pastor, I see so many people that are here today and not here anymore. 
And life is so temporal. And if your value system is away from God and away from Christ, based upon how temporal your life is, how many of you know you feel it? You take a solid nap and you think you almost died. Amen? And you go, is that it? How many of you know what I'm just saying? It's like, my life is here. And it, it's so vain. And without God establishing you as a part of His value system, more than do this and don't do that, you in the new covenant are the most important thing because Christ has put a value on your life in Jesus Christ. He says, you're my temple. You are my base of operation on this earth. But apart from Christ, you just got a dull heart. You're waiting to die. Everything is meaningless. Eat and drink for tomorrow. We're gone. What's the point? Go use somebody's body. Use my body. Nothing's sacred. Nothing's holy. Because our value system isn't built on the finished work of Jesus Christ. That has set in stone our value because of what He did. And we don't have a vision for our life. There's no value system outside of what Christ does. Christ becomes our because. The because of why we're forgiven and the because of why we do anything we do is because of Him. He becomes our vision. And how many of you know today um, you can plan next year and God's just going to laugh at you? How many of you know that's true? And then Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to be with you every step of the way, and I'm going to be your vision for where you go because you're looking to me. I'm the one who has taken the veil away. I want to say a few other things that are so powerful before we're done. It may take another five minutes. Amen. <laughs> he says, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. This veil, this distance between us that causes us not to see the Lord. I want you to notice here when he says, nevertheless, when one, everybody say one. When one turns to the Lord, the word turn is epistrepho, moves his feet in the right direction. Turns his feet and his focus to the Lord. And this word Lord speaks of his ability to take care of it. Speaks of how personal he is. You go from touching all your bases to just turning to one, the Lord. Amen. And it's personal now. And you have repented from going down the road of, I'm doing all this to be good enough for God. To Lord, you're going to have to take it from here and you're going to have to take care of everything. How many of you believe the word Lord means he's in control? How many of you believe the Lord, word Lord means he has dominion over everything? Amen. Somebody might say, well, he has given dominion to us. He's still the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is sovereign. And when you turn from all you trying to control everything and do everything to be good enough for God and say, Lord, I'm just turning to you now. He takes that veil away. You're no longer blind. It's just you and him with an unveiled face, personal, one-on-one. -on -one. And he gives you that boldness to come into his presence even when you don't have it figured out. Even when you're hurting, you come to him and have boldness to come into his presence because of the new covenant that you have with him. I'm going to be thankful that it's not a religion, it's a relationship with God. That's exactly what he's saying here. This is not about performance-based religion. This is about a personal trust in the one who can take care of it. When it says the Lord, it doesn't mean a Lord. It doesn't mean one of the guys. It's not like Muhammad and the rest of them. He's saying there is only one that's qualified, only one that's legitimate. Let me put it Simply to you, hear me now, this is good stuff. He's saying, when you come to the place, when you realize that you are not credible to get to heaven in your own strength, that you have not done it good enough, then you turn to the one who is credible. Amen. You turn to the Lord and say, you are credible. And then what does Jesus do? He takes his spirit and puts it into you. To do an incredible work in you. And to make you credible. He takes the uncredible. They turn to the credible. 
And he does the incredible in us. How many of you can say today God has done an incredible work? Because you know what you were. When I, when we bought this place, when we bought this place, we didn't have the credit to buy it. We were in a tenuous situation where the landlord was from China. I couldn't even speak to her. She was, she was practicing English on me. And every month it was whether we were going to get kicked out of our building as a church or not. And we went back and forth. And then COVID hit and they offered this property to us. And in the midst of COVID, no bank would lend to us. But there was a man in our church that had the credit and the means that I didn't have. And he said, I'm going to co-sign my name next to your name. And it got us into this incredible place. And God did an incredible work through somebody's credit that I didn't have. And that is the new covenant. When God signs his name next to yours and he co-signs on your life. He says, I'll take it because you don't have the credit. I have the credit. And let's do something incredible together. He gives us vision. He gives us hope. And the last thing that I want to say is he gives us freedom. And this is my point. All of this has been reviewed until this point. But let me say it very quickly. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And we get to have a personal walk with the Lord And He is our vision for life. He's not somebody that we're doing this to. Very personal. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we with unveiled face beholding in a mirror, that's the mirror of the Word of God, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. The word transformed in the Greek is metamorpho. Meta with morpho, transfigured. How many of you know if you're with bad company, you turn into bad people, right? But if you get around the Holy Spirit enough, if you're with Him, He transfigures you by virtue of being in you. I, I swear, some people don't give the Holy Spirit enough credit. They say, well, the Holy Spirit's in me, but I can cast them out at any moment. He's kind of just asking permission wherever he can go, and he's just reacting all the time. And they put more value in Tylenol to take care of a headache once received than they do the Holy Spirit once received by faith. Can I tell you the Holy Spirit has more power in you than Tylenol? Why is it you can take Tylenol and it does a work in you? But you don't give God the credit for doing it Himself in you once you received Him. How many of you ever take Tylenol and it worked a little bit? How many of you take stronger? Don't raise your hand. Amen. (laughs) And and look what He says here. I'm going to preach now. I, I know I lied, but forgive me. Okay. Now let me tell you something. He says, look, you turn to the Lord. Who's that? That's Christ. But then He says, but the Lord is the Spirit. Who's that? The Holy Spirit. The Lord who died and finished strong on the cross by virtue of the Trinity is the same Lord that is here today in the Holy Spirit. And He is taking care of His business just like that one did. The Lord is the Spirit. What does Lord mean? Sovereign. Dominion. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What does the word freedom mean? It does not say where the Spirit of the Lord is, you get some freedom. It doesn't say where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's potential. It's like if you take a flashlight and you shine it on the ground. How many of you know there's going to be light on the ground? Wherever the Spirit is, freedom is. What is freedom? It is the state of being free. It is that, how many of you know, when the slaves were freed because of the Civil War, there was a big battle, big war, and then they were set free and there's freedom. I'm telling you that Christ died, He won the victory, and that freedom that He won is not for you to think that you can have some license with some flags in church 
And you got freedom. And that comes with it. There's boldness in the freedom that we have as Christians. But this is more than the word license. This word freedom speaks of freedom from the death of the old covenant. Freedom from uh, uh, trying to muster it up in your own strength and white knuckle it. Freedom from condemnation. Freedom from uh, 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 something that's passing away religious style. The law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Folks, wherever the Holy Spirit is, He is Lord. Do you hear me? He's not one of these tender types that are just trying His best not to be quenched. We have been sealed with Him, and He is Lord, and whether, wherever He is, there is freedom from the dominion of sin over the life of where He is. That's why if He comes into you, He is more powerful than Tylenol. If He comes into you wherever He is, you are a child of... What am I trying to say? I'm saying that it, it kind of sticks when He gets inside of somebody. It is a state of being free. It is not He set us free. Yes, He did. But whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You are no longer a slave. Slaves have to leave the house. Sons abide forever. Why? Because this is an indicative fact. This is not something that says don't be entangled with bondage again since you've been set free. That is a command and it's true. And in our growing up, sometimes we get mixed up and we start trying to keep the law and God says, my kid, just keep growing. But the fact is that something has happened in you by the Holy Spirit. He has written his law in your heart and freedom exists where he is. Does that not bless somebody? I don't know if that helps anybody. But I take the facts of Scripture and I put a period behind them and then I build all the commands on top. He doesn't say where the Spirit of the Lord is. I hope you make it with some freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's potential for you to have some wiggle room to get this right. No. Where the Spirit is, freedom what? Where there. And he gives freedom, and brother, he gives it indeed. Amen. And he works with you as a child, father to child. You are no longer under the old covenant. It, it's not that you took it away. He took it away yes, between you and him when you turned to the Lord. Is that good? Boy, that was a long five minutes, wasn't it? Wasn't that great? <laughs> Praise God. And we are being metamorphosed by the Spirit. Going from glory to glory. And what I love about this passage is that Paul is dealing with a bunch of knuckleheads in this Corinthian church that are easily duped, that are going through all kinds of sexual immorality, all kinds of problems that he's having to deal. But he just launches out into praise about what's in the new covenant at the same time. And he says, God's leading us always into triumph. And praise be to the Lord. We're going from glory to glory. A little bit of glory to more glory. The light of the Holy Spirit is growing on the inside of us. And we're getting gooder and gooder and better and better as by the Spirit of God. Paul's so weird. He can be in a prison cell and blessing God that he's winning. Because it doesn't matter what's going on in the natural in the church today. It doesn't matter to Paul. Paul says, yes, that's true. But the law of the Spirit says we don't end there. Praise God. Amen? Somebody falls, somebody fails, something happens in the church. Yes, we're a big old hot mess. Praise the Lord. But in the next chapter, we're going to read, the power is not of us, but of God. And that's why we do not lose heart. If it's quick, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Every word that man said is true. It's true. Amen. And we say we're Christians and we believe we're Christians, but we're not saved. Amen. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, sweetie. 
God bless you. God bless you. Oh, I'm scared to death if I have to take 1% for all of this. I, I leave it all to God. I'm dirt breathed upon. And all the beauty in my life came from Him. And I'm grateful today. And I want a humble church. And I want people that glorify God. And don't just beat themselves up for not being good enough. Praise God. Because God is building His house. Praise the Lord. Amen. So yes, I want everybody free and bold and excited, but please understand he's talking about the new covenant here and freedom exists where he is. Over in Romans chapter 8, it says that you are in the Spirit if you are saved. He's not just in you, but it's like Christ threw you into the ocean of the Holy Spirit and you took in water. He's all around you. You're in Him as much as He's in you. Yes, Lord. And where He is, freedom is. And the Word cannot be broken. It's established. Amen. How many of you are thankful that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit because you took something that was better than Tylenol? Praise God. Come on, somebody. Amen. Let's all stand up this morning. Have you enjoyed our little exercise today? Has this been good? Let me pray for you now. Father, I pray if there's anybody in this room that's been trying to be good enough for God and their whole value system is on how well they've stopped drinking or how well they gave up this or that, Lord, I pray that you put a value on them in Jesus Christ that goes beyond their struggle. And I, Holy Spirit of God, I pray the Lord is the Spirit would take hold of their life today. Take the blinders off of them and they see Christ personally, intimately, and trust in Him for their life. Jesus, you are a good shepherd. You are the good shepherd. You are the qualified. And I'm praying, Lord God, that you deliver people in this place from being a tragedy. Oh, I preached some bit today. You guys understand I ramp up for the... I'm so proud of y'all for coming to this church and listening to me. But when my dad was 17 years old, he was in a mental institution because his dad was an alcoholic and my grandparents left him there for six weeks. Couldn't do anything with him. And they put him on so many tranquilizers he thought that the maid was his mother. But he remembered his grandmother who said, if you have no one to turn to, turn to the Lord. If there's nobody else to turn to, turn to Him. And he cried out to Jesus in that mental institution where they threw him away. He was gone. They could not get him under control. And he cried out to Jesus and Jesus saved him. The next day the doctor came in and he was in his right mind. They had the police escort him out of his high school because he lost his mind doing crazy stuff but God healed his mind and he told the doctor I'm fine now I can go home because God I talked to God and that guy looked at him like he was crazy and God raised him up and he became a pastor and he's changed the world in ways that I probably will never be able to his reach with that massive church that he built that's now Lake Point. What God can do in a man's life is incredible. Woman's life. And then I, when I was 19, and I had hurt somebody very dear to me through sinful living, and I was on the internet, Indian Nation Turnpike, and I got on the wrong side of the highway because I was crying so hard, beating my chest, saying, why can't you change? Knowing I was disqualified, by definition and I was a ticking time bomb and I just hurt people especially those that are closest to me and I almost hit an 18 wheeler going down the wrong side of the highway I pulled over and cried out to God and God saved my soul and I am here today 50 years old preaching this gospel because I know who did the saving 
And if I'm any kind of testimony to you today, I know I'm not perfect by any means. Sometimes I'm very insensitive and I'm working on me. But I know what he did. And I drove to church today crying out to God saying, I know what you did. I know what you did for me. And I'm praying for those kind of people to come into this church. And Jesus will save them and do an incredible work in their heart. Just like he did for good old John Lee. How many of you are still a Christian because you love Jesus? How many of you are thankful to God for what he's done? How many of you are thankful that he has taken away that veil and making you less religious and more he becomes your because? Is there anybody here today that just says, John, I need Jesus to save me from the power of sin in my life and I want my value to be in him and not because I showed up to church today or I'm religious. I need to know that what he did makes the difference in my life. I'm going to count to three and you just raise your hand and say, that's me today. I'm turning from performance-based religion to Jesus Christ. One, two, three. I see you, brother. I love you so much, man. I love you so much, man. Brother, I see you in the back. I love you, bro. I love you. And when y'all get in your car today, the Bible says, call on his name and you shall be saved. He is rich unto all who call upon his name. And you say this, say, Jesus, be merciful to me. And he will. And he'll give you the new covenant. And he come live inside of you as Lord. How many of you today say, I can't get away with anything? How many of you know that's true? Because he's Lord. It's because he's Lord. You're sealed up and incarcerated with the Holy Spirit. And he just looks at you all the time and messes. How many of you know you can't get away from the Holy Spirit? You're, you're sealed up with him. And he looks at you and he says, you're going to eat all your cornbread? He is, he'll bully you. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word over our lives. And we thank you for the freedom we have because of Jesus Christ. I pray over every life today, Lord God, deliver us, God, from our value being in anything but the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that you are for us and we belong to you. And yes, Lord, there are rules for our health, but not for our salvation. They belong to the cross today. And we thank you today that it is finished in you. In Jesus' name. How many of you like the thief on the cross? They didn't promise the next day to get over cigarettes. But he turned to Christ and asked him to remember him. Do you remember that? Yes. You do the same. Turn to him and be saved. I love you today. We have prayer in the front for anybody who needs it. And we're going to go over and say hi to Johnny for those of you that have teenagers and want free food. God bless you today. We love you. Amen.